Cormac McCarthy saved my life. And it may sound lame or like a cliche, but in this video, I will tell you guys how he did and my personal journey with Cormac McCarthy's works. So I'm sure like a lot of you, I was a big reader when I was young. I wasn't a high IQ, high IQ genius like Cormac McCarthy. And my parents, you know, were readers, but they weren't super deep into philosophy or literature. But in the eighth grade, I had a teacher that changed my life, Mr. Mr. Stewart, who somehow randomly just came across this channel and hit me up. And he introduced me to a whole different side of literature. He gave me The Stranger by Camus, Crime and Punishment, uh, introduced me to Eastern philosophy, and it rocked my world. And even though it was the best thing that ever happened to me, for the next four or five years, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me because I became a hardcore atheist, a materialist, and had a very disconnected and kind of negative view of reality. And this was hard. And the next year, so in ninth grade, I saw the movie No Country for Old Men in theaters, and it blew my mind. Like I'm sure it did a lot of for a lot of you. I was like, "Who is this guy, Chigurh?" Like. It was such a different type of, uh, you know, violent movie than I had ever seen before. So my dad was like, hey, you know, I re read this guy, you know, 10 or 20 years ago when All the Pretty Horses came out. You should read the book. So the next day I went to my school library and for some reason they had the whole Cormac McCarthy's entire bibliography. And I read No Country for Old Men, and I had my mind blown because even though I was reading The Existentialists and you know a lot of these classic authors, I had never seen someone with such beautiful prose. And a lot of the those people were being translated. McCarthy was writing in English, and he was also connecting to the symbolic. And I didn't know at that time that I had a spiritual talent. I'm not trying to be like, oh, but I do enjoy spirituality and individuation and all things symbolic and the occult. And I saw in that moment, I was like, there is something here. There's something magical here. Even though like he's forcing it on me with italics and stuff, something is happening. And so I moved, started moving through his entire works. Next, I read The Crossing, which was devastating. And, you know, eventually worked my way through everything throughout my uh, high school experience. And it was it was shocking, but it really didn't change anything except that I kind of became a McCarthy bro. When people ask, like, what's your favorite book? I was like, Blood Meridian, bro. And uh, I would, you know, start, you know, saying, you like this, you know, you have to read this guy and kind of being a jerk about it. So I resonate with the McCarthy bros. I understand with the you know the people on the Cormac McCarthy subreddit because I was one of the very early ones on there and on the Cormac McCarthy forum I'm trolling and being a jerk and y you guys get it. So eventually though I go to I go to college I go to college uh, uni uh, uh univer University of Utah and while I was up there I got I suffered a terrible concussion and um I suffered this concussion because I was just on a total ego trip. I was doing like hardcore lawn boarding without a helmet on. And I eventually, you know, took a crash because that's what happens. You take crashes. And I knocked myself out, had a huge gash in the back of my head. And because I was dumb and egoic, about a month later, I was skiing without a helmet on. And I cracked a different part of my head open and knocked myself out. And after these two traumatic brain injuries, concussions, whatever we want to call them, I was at a really bad spot. I was suffering from brain bleeding, and I lost the ability to read. I couldn't read anymore. I was taking, I was, at that time, I was a philosophy major, and I couldn't read anymore. I started failing all my classes because I would try to read something, and my head would hurt so bad, and I couldn't remember anything. So at this time, I couldn't do anything. And if you guys don't know, University of Utah is on top, at the base of a mountain, kind of overlooking the Salt Lake Valley. And so I would just go find... A, a beautiful spot every day and just sit like, you know, because I was into Taoism stuff and just overlook the city, do yoga, meditate. And that's all I did for months. And that really helped me start the internal journey and start to look inside. And I started to feel because for the first time in my life, I couldn't think my way out of a situation. I had used rationalism, intellectualism, scientism to you know, try to comprehend reality and not look inward. And 
when I couldn't rely on any of that anymore, I couldn't even, I couldn't even speak well, like, couldn't, like, I had no motivation to go and, you know, try and pick up chicks or anything for the first time in a long time. And so I go on this inward journey and eventually, you know, as I'm failing all my classes, I'm going to lose my scholarship, have to move home, all these impending doomsday things are happening. I turn back to Cormac McCarthy and I pick up the crossing and this was a life-changing moment because when I was reading the book, I couldn't remember what I was reading really. I would read a paragraph and then I'd be like, what the hell is going on? So I'd have to reread. So I would sit out on this hill and luckily this year, like it was the spring around this time, it was a really warm year. I would sit out there and just read and reread Cormac McCarthy's the crossing, you know, probably 20 or 30 times, like, cause I just had to keep reading passages and I just unlocked the next level of Cormac McCarthy scholarship in my brain. Like I was like, holy crap. Like this guy is not just good. Like he is using minimalism and symbolism and great prose and connecting with nature. There was like all these things happening that I couldn't believe. And so I got sucked back slow, sucked back into the Cormac McCarthy world And this time, though, it was not a reinforcement because before it was a reinforcement of my existentialism and atheism. I saw McCarthy as uh, the dark, the the dark materialist or the dark nihilist. This time, though, I saw him as more of a naturalist or animistic, like he was trying to connect with nature and show me something in this realm. And the thinker thinks what the prover proves. And people disregard literature all the time as something that is, is you know, that can't change your life. Like, what's the purpose of it? But when you commit to something, no matter what it is in life, like if you commit to um, a YouTube channel or a business or an idea or a, a, a partner, it changes your life. And when, when my approach to everything in life, including literature, is when I commit to an author, I want to feel them. I want to be able to understand what they are thinking and live out what they are doing. And that's what I did with Cormac. So this time, I went home and I moved. I got basically lost my scholarship, had to move home, and I was reading Cormac and like really getting into like spiritual ecology and spending time out in nature, because I had spent a lot of time out in nature, but not in a very contemplative sense. I would go out there because. Uh, exercise or for like to smoke some weed and look around and be like, oh my God. But I never really spent time out there without anything um, to do. And so that whole summer and that whole fall, I just spent a massive amount of time in the desert. And, you know, a lot of Cormac McCarthy's works take place in the desert. And as I got deeper into that, I realized I want to move away. I want to be away from my parents and kind of go on this natural lifestyle. And so I did. I lived in Oregon for a couple of years. I was a ski instructor living out in the woods. Um, At times, like literally living in my car or out in the woods before it was cool. Like everyone, like uh, living in your car is like cool now. But back in 2011, it was seen as like, you're a loser. Like, why would you want to live in your car and go around? And eventually I came across this golden opportunity where uh, down in Nevada, where I could live on a property as a caretaker and have no responsibilities. I could have my rent and food uh, utilities taken care of. And this was a crazy moment because I had hit like the pinnacle of what most men are seeking. Like I I know a lot of you guys. I've talked to a lot of you guys. I uh, resonate with a lot of you guys. And those of us with like kind of this throwing in mindset, we just wish that we could have a, a house in the woods or out in the middle of nowhere and have little to no responsibilities. And I hit that. I hit the pinnacle. I met someone who was going to literally, once they died, um, give me the property um, if I just sat and took care of it. And I decided when I was out there with all the time, all the freedom in the world, I felt empty inside you guys. I realized that seeking life like John Grady Cole or Billy Parham or the kid I can go through all the list of people. It wasn't enough. That wasn't the key to Cormac McCarthy's work. That was that was the next level. And that's why, you know, I feel like people go on similar trajectories. They get into Blood Meridian and they're kind of into the nihilistic stuff, the violence. Then they kind of move into the nature and maybe some of the pros. And then we'll talk about the next level in a second. So when I was out there, I was like, wait, there's something, there's something wrong. Because I've I, I was writing poetry and doing fiction and like having a great time, but I was like, wait. 
in my meditations, I was told and I felt that the idea that I, I still hold to the day to this day, when one suffers, we all suffer. I was reading. So when I was out there, I was reading all day. I was reading over easily over 200 books a year. I mean, over that 10 year period since graduating high school until, you know, I was about 28. I read over 2000, like real books easily. And after all this dedication to these books, I was like, wait, what the hell am I doing with this novel? Knowledge, excuse me. What I read the story, I've read the story of philosophy multiple times, but what am I doing with this knowledge? I can impress uh, random people. I can be the smartest guy in the room. You know, I, that's great, right? Like to, to have everyone think you're smart, but what's the next level after that? And I started to realize that to find peace within my heart, I had to make a contribution. Uh, there was a great work out there, which was at, and it's, it's for all of us. I mean, I do believe that the purpose, no matter what your purpose is in life, the purpose of all of us, especially if you are smart, is to share that knowledge. And the number one way to share knowledge is through an online format where it's scalable, whether you are writing, whether you're making videos with your face or no face, podcasting, whatever you want to call it, or helping people who are doing that. That is the only way that we can spread knowledge because we can, I can, this video could reach hundreds of millions of people, even though it won't, probably won't even reach a thousand. It, it has the ability to do that, but going and talking to people and being the smartest guy in the room has nothing. And then there's a million excuses that I once had. I don't, I want to be anonymous. What if, you know, if I get big enough, I'll too big, I'll get canceled and there'll be all these problems. There's all these anxieties and fears about the loss of anonymity, but it's all bullshit because we're all just deflecting the true idea because there's enough knowledge. There's enough knowledge just in the story of philosophy. It would take me months if I really wanted to, to like break down everything in this book. It's, you know, hundreds of hours is of actionable content that I can share to the world, share with others exists in this book. And if you go down the historical and philosophical rabbit holes, it's maybe enough for a lifetime. And then when you look at all the other books that you've read, it's all actionable. You can do something with that knowledge and it can help change your, because people are far behind. You are, you know, we have this perception that we're so far ahead, but if you go to the grocery store, most people are idiots. They don't know anything. They don't study. They don't contemplate. They don't individuate. And it's not to say that we're better than them, but they are way far behind on their journey and they are basically unconscious NPCs. They don't have a stake in the game. They are being forced into certain hands by what marketing, advertisement, politics, whatever they are hearing. They don't literally have the ability to make decisions on their own. And can we, does free will even exist? That's a whole other question, but they don't even have a, a process of doing that. And if we can help those people develop that process to be able to do it on their own and they, and for them to go on whatever rabbit hole or, you know, lifestyle, you know, journey they want to, when, the more people that can do that, the greater collective freedom we will have and the greater, greater collective happiness and ideas will reach singularity and like utopia, whatever, we, whatever, or destruction faster, wherever we're heading, that is the way there. And so, I'm out there in the middle of the desert with, you know, a semester of college credits at 23, 24, I'm trying to think, 23, 24, 25. And I'm like, oh my God, like I have to get out. Like I have to do something, but I have no knowledge. I don't have a camera. I don't have a phone. I'm out there, you guys. And I don't even have a phone yet. Um, I hadn't had a phone in four or five years. I would correspond occasionally through email. Uh, my parents and everyone thought I was crazy, but no phone, uh, just a computer that I usually didn't use because I just had physical books and I have just notebooks upon notebooks of you know notes I was taking. And so I'm out there and I'm like, uh, wh where do I go? What the hell do I do? <laughs> and around this time, I started a different YouTube channel. I have multiple YouTube channels. I've been in the YouTube game for seven or eight years now. And I started sharing yoga knowledge and I still do that to this day on that channel. Um, but I started like, okay, I, I know a lot about yoga. I was tra training yoga that entire time. I was teaching people yoga, making side money doing that. So I started sharing yoga knowledge. And then I realized I was like, okay, I need to do more. There's like certain prongs. And so I joined or I signed back up for a university, everyone. And 
God, that was very demoralizing. So I go back to university, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And man, going back as a, I don't remember how old I was, 23, 24 years old. Some, some of the time I'm the oldest guy in the room, I'm suddenly that guy. And smartest guy in the room other than the professors most of the time. And, you know, having to take general education courses again, like science and like all this dumb math, all this dumb stuff. And it was it was hard. It was like literally some of the most demoralizing stuff. I was like, I could literally leave and go back out. But instead, I'm living in the middle of Las Vegas uh, in this terrible, terrible living environment. It was very, you know, just don't get me started on that. And I pulled through, I kept pushing and like, that was one of the darkest times. And during this time, I wasn't really reading Cormac McCarthy. I had read his works um, in full about two times up until this point, done a little bit of scholarly research, um, read a couple things, but I was chilling out. I was reading other people like interested. I had really dived into like philosophy and psychology, had some great professors, but eventually I came back to Cormac. And near the end of my undergrad, I started to uh, really bring it back to Cormac because I realized with all these new skills, I learned how to do Ronkian analysis, Jungian analysis, Freudian analysis, Kantian, like all these different uh, frameworks. I had finally pulled them all together and like synthesized a lot of it into like a system, kind of the system I still use to this day. You know, I haven't released too much of that onto this channel, but well, like technically I have, but anyway, I... Trans, I then refocus on Cormac and read all of his works again. And it, it was mind blowing because finally I saw what was really there. I saw that Cormac is a, has not just multiple layers, but ideas and feelings that we'll probably never be able to find. Like he had, ma he's mastered prose at such a level that it has that, like, iceberg theory, Hemingway stuff going on in there, where there's stuff that we can only guess at. And that was very intriguing to me. So I just started to consume everything. I just, for probably the whole next year, I was just consuming Cormac McCarthy scholarship, you know, read every book that was out there, used the interlibrary loan system, because a lot of these books cost like a hundred dollars to like buy. And it's so dumb because they just use it to sell the university libraries. They, and anyway, it's a whole scam. And so I read all the Cormac McCarthy uh, scholarship I could get my hands on, hundreds of journal articles. And I had a feeling that it was something like that was important, but I really hadn't started this channel yet. And so eventually I graduate, start moving on uh, to some graduate classes and I'm in there and I'm like, man, I'm, so then I refill, cause that's the problem with the university. That's why I'm a critic of it is that it most of the time it's good because it gets you focused on other things, but your time is just like so taken up. Like if you're in graduate school, you're teaching multiple English 101 classes and you're having to do these crazy essays and papers and readings on all these kind of random people that are divergent. There's no like core philosophy of the school. I mean, the, old, the closest thing you can get is taking the same professor over and over again and kind of like building with them like their point of view of reality. And that's what I was doing. I'm sitting here with, you know, National Book Award finalists and, uh, you know, one of my professors is one of the, you know, a very famous Hemingway scholar. So I'm like learning about Hemingway and all this stuff. But uh, I didn't have, you know, I lost track of Cormac for a while. And during, you know, and so eventually I came back to Cormac. And the reason that Cormac saved my life, you know, let's, let's kind of get into this. The first, the first time was because he showed me like real literature. He took me out of kind of that Russian existentialist zone. And even though he's put me into nihilism, he showed me that there was like greatness. There was genius still alive. I remember reading his Wikipedia page and being like, oh my God, when is he going to die? Like, Jesus, it's 2007. Like, how much longer do we have? Is he going to release another novel? I was so worried. I was, you know, <laughs> I was checking if he was dying all the time. I was like, please, no. Like, that gave me hope to be a writer. Uh, I guess I should have said that. He made me want to be a writer. In eighth grade, I was like, I should be a writer. But when I read Cormac, I was like, this is how I want to write. This is who I want to be. Like, wow, he's reclusive. He doesn't do this stuff. Then he helped me get back into knowledge. He helped uh, humble me to minimalism, to this new way of reality. He got me into nature, which 
really was the most pivotal thing that's ever happened to me, being able to go out there. Most people never have the opportunity to spend years without a phone, without any responsibility other than some, some landscaping. Uh, and he was kind of the cornerstone of that whole experience, like showing me. Because that's what he did. He would spend years out in nature without technology living. I was like, wow. And then eventually, uh, she showed me what I really care about as a scholar, as a uh, in terms of like literature, people who write about nature, who appreciate that thing, who have kind of a magical tint to that and who are aggressive with their prose. That's what I really care about. That's what I want to study. Even though I have other interests in yoga, the occult, psychology, philosophy, if I'm in looking at literature, I think that's what's most actionable and most transformative because we can achieve greatness with our writing and our thinking, and we can reconnect with nature. We can step away from the machines, from all this bullshit that we're being inundated with that McCarthy talks about, his, you know, the anti-civilization, the anti-technological stuff that he's into. That's very important. Even though I'm here on YouTube talking to you right now, and you're probably on a phone, we're still, uh, and hopefully, I'm still, and hopefully you are too every day, trying to not buy into too much of this, st- too much of the stuff you see on your phone or in this, you know, in consensual reality, reality, especially the technological one. And so, eventually, what is it, you know, eight or nine months ago, I really started to make Cormac McCarthy content. I don't know what I was really doing on this channel. For two or three years, I was just making random videos. And I was, you know, I was passionate about, about a lot of those things, but... You know, I guess it was just kind of like the universe saying, like, you can talk about Cormac, like you can do something good, you know, on YouTube. And it's now transformed my life again, because like I said, I've been on YouTube for seven years. You may think that I'm or don't think that I'm an eloquent speaker um, or at least can get ideas across in a decent way. The other day, someone was like, you effing suck. You're never going to make it on YouTube. No wonder you have 4K subs. You have no charisma. And so and if you go watch my videos from like 2014, 2015, that's who I was fumbling. Uh, yeah, uh, I was like ranting and like, I am ranting right now, but I had no direction. I had no really talent as a speaker and I've built that now and I've retransformed myself over the last eight or nine months with Cormac McCarthy because I actually have people listening. There are, like there are hundreds of people who will, if not thousands, who will watch one of my videos now. And I don't want to put out shit. I want to go back to my original vision of helping people transform their life through literature, through knowledge, and through a bunch of other stuff. And I'm like, man, now it's really happening. It's not just a dream anymore where I used to post videos. I would make, I'd make videos, you guys, that are just as good as anything I'm putting out now. And I'd wake up the next morning, I'd post it at 5 p.m. and it would still have zero views. Some of them have finally picked up and have, you know, 100, view now, 100 views now. But I remember posting a five-hour breakdown of Becoming Animal by David Abram. It's still a sick video of mine. Like I said, woke up the next morning, zero views. After a couple months, 30 views. <laughs> Most of them were probably my friends. Some of them were me clicking on the video, hoping that someone left a comment. Um, and so thank you guys for like being here and supporting that. And like this is transforming my life again because I'm getting momentum. I'm trying to be more accountable. I'm starting the Cormac McCarthy course and like it's hard to get on there and be accountable all the time and like keep up with the content and like help people get their money's worth, you know, $5 a month or whatever. And I'm trying to do it. And like this is the first time in my life I'm trying to build something on my own. I'm not, you know, having to rely on a job like I have right now. Like I, I'm, I've got an, a hundred emails at least from this community, like people talking to me about all types of stuff. I get emails about trauma. I get the craziest people. I mean, there's Cormac. I've had to contemplate my own digital footprint um, because you Cormac McCarthy fans are fucking crazy sometimes. I've had multiple people like send me the weirdest Instagram messages, emails. I've had people send me voice chats like veiled as death with veiled death threats in there. Like just the wildest things. I get at least five comments a day saying, you don't know anything about Cormac McCarthy. Just like breaking me down. Like you're balding. Like, am I bald? I don't know. And I'm like having to contemplate this stuff every single day. And it's literally making me better. And it's making me stronger. Like Cormac and like his work is like, and even though I'm moving on, like 
we're moving on to other people on this channel. I have uh, uh, I have other channels that are going to be way bigger than this channel will ever be because people don't read. But Cormac is giving me that momentum. Like, look at my videos a year from now and look at what I'm doing right now. I'm one taking this right now. It's it's at a whole different level. So thank you, Cormac, for changing my life four different times. I can't imagine what the fifth, I know what the fifth time is going to be. It's when I am going to be declared and not to be like, not to let the hubris get out of control, but eventually I am going to be the number one. If I, I'm already the number one, but I'm going to be the definitive Cormac McCarthy content creator out there. Like no one else on YouTube is keeping up with my pace. There's a reading McCarthy podcast. There's that like uh, there's a couple random people who make some content sometimes, but I'm trying to make thousands of videos. I'm trying to bring millions of people in on a deeper look at Cormac McCarthy's work, just not looking at the book. I know Wendy Goon makes a video and he can get millions of people, but they'll watch anything he puts out. He could talk about, you know, any random book and it will get millions of views. And so that is the goal to help that. And I feel like that's the next transformation because when I get big enough for that, after I do the Blood Meridian tour, the crossing tour, and I, for every one of his books, make thousands of videos on the Cormac McCarthy course on all the locations. That the traveling is going to be a growth experience for me. But at the end of it all, I'm going to hopefully be at the top of the heap, and I'm going to get up there and say, guys, we can't be snoots. We can't be these. We stop being so academic. Put your work out there. Say something. Do something. No one cares about the Cormac McCarthy Journal. I do, but I. From what I, having worked at multiple literary journals that are bigger than the Cormac McCarthy Journal, I know that they do not have thousands of subscribers. If they have a thousand, they are getting probably pretty lucky. Who are paying, you know, whatever amount a year. So that's the goal to activate this community because I know that Cormac McCarthy's work can change the world. It does have a lot of um, power in it. But we need the people. We need, I need you guys to start posting videos. I have my boy, um, Silly the Kid, Ethan. I think, sorry, right? Ethan, um, I might be blanking. He's making videos. I know my boy Alistair's making videos. Uh, AJP's making videos. Like there's a couple people who I've interacted with who are like, hopefully I'm inspiring to like continue making content on Cormac. And I'm hoping I can make a hundred of you guys because I have my deficiencies. I am weird. Like, you know, maybe people don't like me, but maybe there's someone out there who will be very charismatic, who will be maybe a girl, um, will really bring Cormac McCarthy to the people, uh, literature to the people, real literature, and put it out there. And so that's hopefully my role right here is to be kind of the battering ram for the next level. And the next level is something great. The next level is real literature being revitalized. There's a renaissance of people looking back because things have gone so bad in social media and stuff that we turn to the greatest and understand it and view them objectively and move away from the diversity quotas that we're stuck in right now in the book publishing world. But it all starts with us making content because the book publishing industry is done. They suck at marketing. They're bad people. And they just, they, they aren't going to get it done for us. We have to do it ourselves, but we have to slave. You have to learn the technology. You have to get on here and make the thumbnail and do all, or write the blog posts and create a website and pay for it every single month. But at the end of all that is a better world. And if this is what you like to do, if this is what you like to think about, then hit me up. I will tell you the path that, uh, the, the programs, the camera, the microphone, the equipment, the blog, uh, the hosting website, the domain site I use. I'll tell you literally everything I'm doing because I've sat and done this for seven or eight years, all with the goal of spreading literature to the world so that you can do it too. That's what I'm hoping you can do. That's the whole point of this video. If Cormac's changed your life, then you have an obligation to him to do something with that knowledge. Handing it down to your children is not enough. You write a blog post, I'll promote it. You make a video, I'll promote it. I will help you because we need to help each other because it's not like I, there is no money to be made. I'm just going to tell you right now. There's no money. There's no fame to be had on BookTube. <laughs> just the way it is. There's just not enough readers. There's an inherent flaw in BookTube that a lot of smart people are very close-minded. And like, if someone says something wrong, like I'll say one thing wrong. They're like, yeah, I knew you were an idiot. Never watching this again. Like, say one thing wrong and people just leave, you know, in the personal development space or like the religious space or like 
uh, whatever space, like people aren't like that. People aren't as judgmental, but when you have a bunch of rational intellects, especially like the logical people, which you know tend to go to the smarter authors, it's a very tough crowd and they especially aren't going to give you money. So it's like we are doing, it's a very selfless pursuit, but eventually, like I said, hopefully we can pave the way for the people who can make a difference, in, whether they be, anyway. So that's how Cormac McCarthy changed my life. In the next video, I'm going to talk to you guys. This is kind of a series. First one was the why you should read all of Cormac McCarthy's novels. This one's a personal how he changed my life, how I think he could change your life. And next, I'm going to talk about the life of a Cormac McCarthy scholar, what it's like to go deeper, to be at a level where I've read, I've spent thousands of hours on Cormac stuff and plan to do thousands of hours more and what that is kind of like and what the process is like because anyone can do it. I can tell you that I've I learned some decent stuff at university, but nothing I wouldn't have gone myself. Like the only thing I got at university was random shit I never would have done myself. I became a Ronkian, a massive Hemingway fan. I learned more about indigenous, uh, like modern uh, woke politics and like land rights and like all this crazy political stuff that I will ever need in my life. Um, <laughs> I learned all that and that was fine and fun. But in general, you could be an idiot. You could be a 45-year-old man who's sat on his couch and smoked weed his entire life and become a Cormac McCarthy scholar and be damn good at it. Uh, I see it all the time. I've been to Cormac McCarthy conferences and met people who are random, uh, random people, independent scholars who would give write damn fine papers and give good presentations. And they're just common commoners, uh, just like you and I. And so... Let's get it going, and I will see you guys in that next video.